I like to watch a lot of old movies. I know you do too. Yes, I do. There is a phrase that comes up in old movies pretty much exclusively from the 30s. I don't understand what it means. And it, they say it all the time. That's very white of you? No. I know what that means. Someone will walk into a room and it will be full of people they know. Inevitably, someone will pipe up, it looks like it's old home week around here. Old home week. I, I don't understand what those words mean when put together in that way. This must be old home week, they say. Uh, well, it seems like it would be uh, like a homecoming. Homecoming might have used to be called Why is old it a, home week. a week? I don't know. Homecoming, when I was in college, homecoming was a week. When I was in high school, homecoming was a week. So it's homecoming. Possibly. I don't know. I'm not uh, 100 years old. Uh, for those of you out of country, homecoming is like a fall sports thing that it's a, coll- do. a college yeah. thing. Alumni go back to their old alma mater and they celebrate the big game. Yes, and they don't look at each other and say, "Well, it looks like it's old home week around here." They don't have to; they know already. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Tonight in The Basement, I've got something special for us. Yeah? This is something we haven't done in a long time. It's time for a Shandango. Really? The chill you feel in the air is not just the onset of autumn, but the approach of the Iceman. Ah, this. I remember this coming out, seeing ads for it, and thinking, nope. Well, tonight, yep. Released in 2012, the Iceman stars Winona Ryder, Chris Evans, James Franco, David Schwimmer, and Basement alumni Ray Liotta and Michael Shannon. That's that's a cast for you. And that's a cat for you. It was co-written and directed by Israeli filmmaker Ariel Vroman. There were some casting shakeups before shooting commenced. James Franco was supposed to play the Chris Evans role. Benicio Del Toro was supposed to play the Ray Liotta role. Maggie Gyllenhaal was supposed to play the Winona Ryder role, but she got pregnant and had to drop out. Everyone knows pregnant women can't act. I didn't find much information about this movie, but I found a 2012 interview with Michael Shannon. He didn't say much about the film, but he did say that he once on a subway platform, mistook James Franco for a homeless man. (laughs) This movie documents the true story of contract killer Richard Kuklinski, who was a killer for the mob. Earlier this year, I gave you a little gift called Smash Glass. Now, I know you've been having fun with it, fooling your friends, going to the country club and raising hell. Two to three times a week. But I'm happy to say that the good people at Jokes and Gags have more tricks up their sleeve. And this one... Like the Iceman, it's a little bit dangerous. I see. Oh, lordy. You've given me rattlesnake eggs? That's right. Are you trying to terrify me? Look at how scared that kid is. This kid, so scared he got a lockjaw. <laughs> Use over and over. Which is great because I have a friend who has a memento disease and he hates snakes. <laughs> hey, meet me over at the old leather couch. I need you to take care of that thing that we talked about. That thing is watching the Iceman. Blyberg! <laughs> Ray Liotta. I'm Ray Liotta and I tried and I used Chantex. 1964, Jersey City, New Jersey. Most creatively named city in New Jersey. Richie Kuklinski is out on a romantic date with Deborah. He doesn't talk much because he doesn't have much to say, but he sure does like her. What do you do for a living, she asks. I dub cartoons for Disney. No way. What's your favorite? The Great Mouse Detective, episode four. (laughs) You dark wizard. Well, time to go scowl at something. Later on at the pool hall, we find out that Richie actually dubs porn. Dubs. I don't know what he does. Put sound effects in. (laughs) There's the guy there talking trash about Deborah. He says that his friend used to date her, but he broke up with her because she wouldn't put out. She's saving herself for marriage. Oh, my friend. It's in the way that she uses it. (laughs) Down, down. Richie doesn't like this kind of talk, and he doesn't like the fact that the guy tries to welch on the bet after they win the pool game. 
That's a glare that few escape from alive. In fact, he doesn't like it so much that he goes out and kills the guy. You've been Iceman. Although the date was awkward and the dating ultimately murderous, things go rather well and within a year and a half they're married and they have a baby. That baby is six months old. <laughs> I've been give, give it a rest, Dad. I've been wanting, I've been wanting to see this child for a very long time. <laughs> Richie is still hard at work at the porno lab. What's the matter, Richie? You still there? Porno never <laughs> sleeps. A bunch of goons show up at the lab one night, including this guy, Roy DeMeo, the mob guy. I'm not into porn myself, but I gotta look out for my customers. I also gotta get home and stir the sauce. <laughs> but they're short on some of the porn because something happened. Well, Mr. DeMeo, says Richie, it's because we just found out today that you needed all these. It takes a while to process the film. Bam! Stop talking back. Stop whining. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for those things. His guy, Sicoli, wants to kill Richie. Hey, if I work all night, I can finish it up. Roy decides to let it slide. Perhaps he sees something in this Richie Kuklinski character. Richie's at home with the wife, taking care of the baby. This is a private conversation. Yes. They dream about a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood, but they just can't afford it. I like the way you take care of me. No diggity, no doubt. Roy's head flunky is a guy named Josh. Hey, I hear you're using my name and pretending to be my son. You need to be your own man. And Josh is young and he says, okay. The mob guys take Richie on a car ride. There's this hobo outside that's bothering them. Check it out, it's a gun. What do you think of that? You think you're a fancy fun guy? Do ya? You think you can sass back to me? I'm closing the porn lab. Sorry, but you're out of a job. Well, you seem to be cold and emotionally distant. Do you like killing people? Prove your loyalty by going and killing that hobo. Here's a gun. Have fun. Richie does so. What are you smoking? Camel. Well, I'm smoking pistols. You had that, like, cool line you could have said, but he didn't. <laughs> Maybe he'd be good at killing people who aren't homeless and actually in Dutch with the mob. And you're only gonna work for me, nobody else. From then on, Richie's life is murder, murder, murder. Murder, murder, murder. And he's making a lot of money. Flash forward to 1975. They've got a nice new house. Richie's out having dinner with his old pool hall friends and their wives. Big yacht, one of those big fancy boats. The one you can eat and drink anything you want on. Anything? Can you eat a kimono dragon? Can you drink a mountain? It goes from dubbing cartoons to international banking. Cartoons? Is that what you call porn these days? Porn? Richie tells everyone that his job is in currency exchange. What's currency exchange? It's high class porn. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> Josh Rosenthal is at a cocaine deal with some Cubans. He kills the Cubans. <laughs> you two have been schwimmered and steals the cocaine. This really angers the Cuban mob who want him dead. Back home, Richie and Deborah are making sweet love. But they're interrupted by the little girls and their nightmares. Little Japanese drowned girls. You're the bad dream. <laughs> Can I stay in here with you? Not tonight. I gotta finish my sex making. Hey, I'm going shopping. Need anything? More cologne? Oh, day slaughter. Richie goes and sees this photographer, James Franco. He's just a naughty guy who might know the whereabouts of Rosenthal. He shakes him down and eventually murders him. Bam, you're dead. What he doesn't know is that the photographer's model is hiding in the closet. She saw the whole thing. Richie sends her off because he doesn't kill women or children. But you know who does? This man. His name is Mr. Freezy. He's another killer type person. Well, though he's a lot more elaborate. He likes to use bombs and poisons and stuff like that. Not just the old pulling the bullet finger. They need to go kill that girl because she's going to talk. But Richie doesn't let that happen. Word gets back to Ray. Roy. Word gets back to Ro Mr. DeMeo finds out that Richie let the girl go, and he's mad. You're not going to work for me anymore. And you're not going to work for anybody else, that's for sure. You're retired. <laughs> <laughs> Richie goes and visits his brother Joey in jail, who he hasn't seen in 11 years. I think you're different than me, huh? My mustache isn't as loose on the bottom. You're going to end up just like me right here. Hey! You, you come back here and listen to my foreshadowing. Well, that was a bad visit. The old shower decompress. Yeah. That's a nice little movie trope. Magic. It's magic. It's magic. It's 
skating with the Iceman. The Iceman. The Iceman. Ooh. He killed James Franco. It's a killing thing. But little It's a terrible thing to do. Richie looks back on his childhood and his abusive father. Ugh. Richie finally hooks up with Mr. Freezy to get some work on the side. He can't be slowed down when it comes to killing. Mr. Freezy has all these interesting ways of killing people. He uses chemicals and cyanide, and he freezes the bodies. To throw off the forensics, guys. Oh, by the way, that girl who witnessed that murder, she didn't get away all that long. Richie says, I'm in. He's got this big freezer full of bodies. Their partnership lasts for a couple years. Right now, we're at about 1979. Leo Mertz has wanted Rosenthal dead for years. Roy eventually has to give up Josh. He's supposed to end up with Rachel, no! <sighs> but then Sicoli, DeMeo's right-hand man, puts his hands on Leo. What the hell, man? Leo's a made guy. What the hell? And he's not gonna put up with that. You're a dead man, Sicoli. You're a slacker, Sicoli. Leo Mertz hires Mr. Freezy to murder Sicoli. Let's try to make this as complex as possible. Instead of just putting a bullet in the guy, why don't we go to a discotheque and blow poison in his face and then he'll die of a heart attack. So how's Atlantic City looking? They blew up the chicken man late last night. <laughs> Had a heart of ice. You get to see Michael Shannon dance. Richie boogies on up to Sicoli and kills him with the murder spray. <laughs> Annabelle is turning 16 years old. That's wonderful. The mob shows up. Because if we cross paths again, I'm going to bury your whole fucking family. Not a very good tactic on DeMeo's part. He's basically saying, I dare you to kill me. <laughs> It's been three months since the Sicoli hit. So they meet down at a cemetery. Leo Mertz was going to pay him 50 grand. You guys are supposed to keep it on the down low, and you didn't. And now I'm in trouble with Roy DeMeo. So 10 grand is all you get. Bam, bam, bam. Now you're dead. Well, he did it in the cemetery. Now they don't have to take him very far. And that's how the Iceman passes the savings along to you. I'm creeping and I'm creeping and I'm creeping. But I damn near got caught because my beeper kept beeping. Annabelle is injured in a hit and run. And it weren't no accident. It's clear that the mob has got their sights on Richie. This is the end of it. Beautiful friend of it. <laughs> Richie and Freezy are both in trouble because there's all these headlines about their murders coming out. So Mr. Freezy cuts his hair to go undercover, but he drives around in the same truck that has his name printed on it. Richie murders Mr. Freezy. That was Mr. Easy. Richie realizes that he needs to do away with Mr. DeMeo, and he's going to use the old cyanide trick. He meets with this guy. He says, I need some cyanide. Can you get it for me? The guy says, yes, I got this cokehead kid who's been bothering me, and I want you to kill him. If you do that for me, I'll do this for you, and it'll be like a tradesies. Richie agrees to do it. Hey, how you doing, big guy? Hey, how you doing? Hey, paisan. Hey, oh, some of this. Hug. <laughs> He gets the sign and he makes these little sandwiches. He's going to give the kid a sandwich and kill him with it. While he's making the sandwiches in his little trunk kitchen, he gives some of the cyanide to a cat. The cat doesn't die. That's weird. Cyanide is broken. Suddenly, Richie is pulled over by the ATF. Bad boys, bad boys. <laughs> what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? His wife is in the car with him. There's lots of screaming. There's lots of arresting going on. Razzle him, dazzle him, razzle, dazzle them. There's that Dominic guy who was an undercover cop the entire time. How could I be so stupid? He's going to go to jail for a long, long time. We see an old imprisoned Richie with a long, greasy beard. My only regret is that I hurt my family. Well, those other hundred people, I can take him or leave him. Ice. The Iceman cometh and wenteth. Lots of people died in the process, but luckily not in the basement. I really enjoyed it while I was watching it, but sitting here right now, I can already feel it kind of breaking apart in my brain and melting away, drifting off I like smoke. It doesn't have a lot of gravity. No, it has too much gravity. I didn't really enjoy it while it was going on. It was a joyless movie. It should have layers. Nothing. It was just so gray. The tone of it fit the story, though. Because even, you know, knowing things about that guy's life, knowing things about his childhood, he had a pretty lousy life. 
Sadie agrees with me. It was an emotionally distant movie, and I didn't find the central character to be all that interesting. I didn't really feel like I knew the guy. You don't feel like you know anybody. No, you yeah. don't. I didn't have a problem with the tone, and I didn't have a problem with the pacing. I had a problem with the plot. The Josh Rosenthal storyline makes no sense to me. And the James Franco scene makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, it's like, oh, Franco could come in for a couple days. I don't know why that murder happened. I thought the Iceman was tracking down Rosenthal to kill him. But then in the next scene, we see Rosenthal sitting in the office with his dopey mustache going, oh, here I am. Yeah. I I don't get it. The casting of Franco was a distraction. You know, that's something that you give to an up-and-comer, not someone who is already on top of the world. Despite the Iceman's intense feelings for his family there's no emotional core to the movie chris evans was really good in this it's something we haven't seen him do before yeah you don't see him play this kind of like sleazy character mm-hmm. he's the only person in the movie who seems to be having a good time yeah both as an actor and as a character right i do have to say that i find it admirable that the movie was unromantic about the life about mm-hmm. mobsters in general. There's no desktops full of cocaine. You have an office in the upstairs of a crappy restaurant that you'd never want to go to. You have to answer to, you know, someone bigger. You drive around in cars, you're unpleasant all the time. It's just not a good life. So it doesn't have that good fellas pizzazz sure. to it, which is probably for the best. The cinematography in this was adequate. Everything was too dark. It was too dark, so I'm going to say it's not adequate. Uh, Trying to get away with the Gordon Willis thing from The Godfather. I remember the 80s. We had lights in hospitals. They didn't have long <laughs> stretches of unlit hallway there. Or Well, I'm talking about sh- shot composition mm-hmm. and things like that. It's, it's adequate. With how dark the look of the film was, they're overselling the darkness of the story. Mm-hmm. There were certain things that were glossed over. Uh, Richie Kuklinski was a really bad domestic abuser. He oh. beat his wife up quite a bit. That was not touched on at all, except for that one scene where he kind of wrecks the kitchen. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Mr. Shannon. He was doing his thing. He's doing as much as he can, but again, the character isn't as rounded and fleshed out as he wanted to be, particularly since he's in pretty much every scene in the movie. Yeah, and he's the guy to play that character. Yeah, he is. That's a sweet spot. The movie just doesn't let us in. It no. shows us a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't like really invite us in. It doesn't I let us into the head of a murderer. I don't think there's any in to be let into. The movie's just kind of these gangster tropes that are kind of cobbled together. It's just so cold. It's winter, but it hasn't snowed cold. There's no spring in the life of Richie Kuklowski. (laughs) Only winter and more winter. The Iceman. Hope he doesn't come knocking on your door. But if you haven't seen the movie, you could check it out. With your eyes. And now, seen it. Seen it. More of a Bogart. Oh, yeah, Mr. More of a Bogart. Bogart. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah Kaplan writes, The Imposters, a stacked cast, and weird as it sounds, one of the funniest end credit sequences I've ever seen. Seen it. Seen it, but I have not seen the end credit sequence because they didn't make it that far. Turned it off mid-movie. Yes, I did. You know, when I was watching The Imposters, I thought to myself, I want to love this, and I should love this, but I don't. I think they just threw too much stuff into it. It's too weird. Well, it's they wanted to make literally a movie like they would in the 1930s, but with an ironic distance from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you have like that great moment of the German played by um, Campbell Scott. It's his love song to Lily. Lily, Lily, Uber, Lily. It's the worst love song ever. That's funny. This is funny, but it just didn't all go together in that screwball comedy way. It's just like a mishmash. And I think it also had the problem that it was made by the guys who made Big Night. It was a follow-up to Big Night. And I, like all decent human beings, love Big Night. Oh, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I should revisit it. Sometimes I think it's good not to go in with fresh eyes. It's good to go in with stale eyes. Oh, okay, now that I know what this movie is, I I can accept it more. The end credit sequence is really good. They do this little choreographed dance. It's a lot of fun. Blind Spot writes, Have you watched Little Miss Sunshine by Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris? Seen it. Seen it, yeah. I saw it with you the second time I saw it. Oh. Yeah, I saw it in the theaters and I saw it when it came out on video at your old place. You were there too, Tana. The first time I watched it, I thought, oh, the movie's gonna do that and I'm gonna hate it. And then the movie does it, and I'm like, oh, I love it. It works. Yeah, Yeah. everything works in the movie and everything is a cliché. Except for the climax at the competition, which was not expected. Yeah, the lovable loser, when Mm -hmm. pulled off well, 
it really works. And yeah. this is a whole family of lovable losers. That's right. Two Fingers, Four Arrows writes, Have y'all biscuit heads seen Dogville? It's a beautiful, uncomfortable, and unique experience in film, which seems to be Lars von Trier's modus operandi. Many episodes ago, Matt chastised Trier for making films that seem deliberately difficult and uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, I have done that probably multiple times. My wife won't allow the guy in the house. Dogville seen it. I am going to sound like someone who just turns off movies all the time. I started watching it. <laughs> but the reason I turned it off was not that I was uncomfortable. It was that it was too slow. All right, how far are we into the movie? Only half an hour? No! It's a tough movie to t for me to talk about because I did hate it. The way he treats his female protagonist is sadism bordering on psychosis. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge the fact that there are aspects of this movie that are completely unique and even beautiful and unlike anything you've ever seen. And I think that is Von Trier's modus operandi. I'm going to make movies that you hate. Mm -hmm. and you can't dismiss them and you can't dismiss me because I'm a provocateur that has the talent to back it up. He's like Godard in that way. Yeah, but he has more talent, I think, than Godard. I love the set of oh, yeah. that movie. Oh, the and set is gorgeous. Particularly since I know where it's all going to end to, where the town not turning the other way from a horrible crime that's happening. And the fact that there are no walls, that, you know, people are hiding in their homes, but they're not hiding. You always hear about how horrible Von Trier is, how traumatic he is for his lead actresses. People just keep going back to work with him. Are his sets just, like, joys to be in? The cameras go off and they all laugh and they pass around champagne and cranberry sauce. <laughs> What's going on? That Laura Dern's like, yeah, I'm coming back. Coming with me, Charlotte Gainsbourg? <laughs> Why? I don't know. If you've got the stomach for it, you can tackle Dogville. I find it misanthropic to a degree that I don't want to engage with. Some time ago, one of you good people sent us this movie. It's The Triplets of Belleville. Seen it. Seen it, yes. Yeah, so this is by the same filmmakers that did the Jacques Tati, The Illusionist, mm -hmm. which also was sent to us. Can't say that I loved it, or I'm not sure I even liked it, but... There's no denying that this is unlike any movie I or you have ever seen. Yeah, it is a complete cinematic experience. The uh, imagery in the movie, the weird weariness of it all. It has a great protagonist, the grandmother, who is going to save her son sure. from the gangsters of Belleville. It's like my mom. If one of her grandsons were taken away, she would row across the ocean to save him. <laughs> and the music in this movie is a lot phenomenal. It's one of the few soundtracks that I still listen to for enjoyment. I do think this is a movie that everyone should see. Yes. Looks like it's old home week around here. We've got a job for you. Go to our website, welcome to the basement show.com. It has all of the episodes we've ever done, and there are PayPal donation buttons. You can click on them and donate a few dollars or whatever to support our show. Donors such as James, who says, Loving you guys from out here in Southern California. I've been watching Blame Society since the days of Super Shooter and Fun Rangers. Thank you, James. Super Shooter! To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing. It's an entirely separate show. We open mail. We do fun surprises, and you can see it this coming Friday. Every Friday that you don't see this show, you see that show. We got your Fridays covered for you. That's right. Stay in. Don't go to work. Wait. Wait. The movie is over. The Iceman is now safely in jail, and we are glad that you joined us. And now, watch this. Mr. Kropinski. It's good to see you all again. Glad to see you can now afford this restaurant again, now that you've embarked on a new venture with Mr. Freezy. So I went into your office to get your jacket to take the cleanest, and there was a lot of money in A lot of cyanide in that pocket. <laughs> I got dizzy. You're gonna end up just like me right here.